welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Done Radio Hour. This week we have another Meet the Cast episode. You might have thought we were done with Meet the Cast episodes, but we added a new cast member. So you'll get to hear from Karen Perta, our newest actor in the troupe. Before you do, we've got some people to thank. We'd like to thank Circle 270 Media, which this podcast is a part of. We'd like to thank Mad Lab Theater, our wonderful host site that we love dearly. We will be performing there very soon on Saturday. April 14th at 5.30 p.m. We've got a great show for you, so I hope you'll come out and check us out. Tickets are available at badlab.net slash tickets. We also have to thank our parent network. It's all the Numb Presents, found at iabdpresents.com. There's lots of great programming, podcasts, written work, video series, and more. The newest show on the network is called Squatch Smashers. Do you have a problem with rampant Sasquatches stealing your apples? Maybe a ghost is hanging around your breakfast nook saying mean and scary things about your hair. In either case, you need to get help from Squatch Smashers Weekly Comedy Podcast. Follow the advice and adventures of Zeke Delfour and his unwilling co-host Vlad as they explore the world of Bigfoot and the supernatural from a t-shirt kiosk and a failing mall. Listen to Squatch Meshers Weekly Comedy Podcast. It's all been done anyway, so check out IABD Presents. And you can support all our programming by going to patreon.com slash IABD, where just for a few dollars a month, you can get some pretty cool stuff and support us to make more great programming. Now enjoy this Meet the Cast. Welcome out to another Meet the Cast episode. You may have thought they were done, because we haven't done one in a few months, but we have another cast member, so we're doing another Meet the Cast. Uh, joining me is Karen Perta. Hi. <laughs> Karen, You. what was your first episode with us? Was that... My first episode... Do you remember what month? It, it was, was April year. of last year, so April. Rhyme and rhyme again. That's correct. The top notch tag. And then I was also in the porn stars segment too, as Sandra, that same live show. Back to work. Uh, yeah. yeah. So those episodes hit the podcast feed in December. You've done a lot more episodes than have been released as of yet. I know. So by the time this episode comes out, everyone's going to be like, Karen, who's that? <laughs> well, they'll have heard rhyme and rhyme again. They'll have heard back to work. And then you weren't in May at all, were you? Uh, no, I wasn't. Remember. No, I did May, June, July, August, September, what did October. You do in I did. June? Um, I was in Porn Stars. Three's Company. Yes. Okay. Yes, I was Gina in that episode. Oh uh, yes, the one of the girlfriend or girls that was sleeping with Stacy's boyfriend. Cover. Correct. So yeah, that you would have just heard uh, last week on the podcast feed, and then in two weeks there's another Top Notch Tangler episode coming up where you return as Cam. So let's talk about Cam. That was in the audition packet as a reoccurring role, I believe, wasn't it? it I not? don't remember. I don't. It I don't know. Okay, maybe I just had in my head that it'll probably be reoccurring, but I won't. We'll see, like, how the part goes. Yeah, because I remember you emailed me and um, after you had cast me, and you were like, I, hey, I knew we were going to see this character again, but it's actually going to be in the um, July show. Are you mm. available? Yes. So, yeah, that'll be coming out in the feed soon. But, obviously, Cam is a love interest for Carl Darling. Mm-hmm. And fans probably were prepositioned to hate Cam, I think, because they were rooting for Kim and Carl. Yeah, I mean, the way you're introduced to her, she's a hostage, mm-hmm. and she's kind of like, not super phased, I mean a little bit, but not yeah. super phased by the hostage situation, and she's kind of forward, she's the one who asks Carl out, Yeah. so I don't, I don't know how that would sit with people. See, I don't, I don't necessarily think the character was, did anything this is, that was like, oh, I don't like that character for that reason, it's more just, oh, why is she flirting with Carl, Carl belongs with Kim. Because if you follow the top-notch Changler... Right, but Cam the character doesn't necessarily know like that. As far as he's sure. concerned, Carl's fair game. Absolutely. Well, he is single. Uh, so, at yeah. the time, when you meet him. Right. Uh, I think as time goes on and the character gets more developed, I think she gets more and more unlikable. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but also, we see a lot of similarities with Kim. That's true. That's true. But kind of... Super. I feel like all those similarities are superficial, mm-hmm. and that's about it. Yeah. I mean, certainly we get some insight into her in this next episode when they're out on her yacht. Right. With so their staff. They look similar, they're both rich, and their names are just one letter off, mm-hmm. but I feel like the similarities kind of end there. I don't know. We may explore further similarities down the road. Although I do feel like Cam is brave. 
Yeah, she's no coward. Right, yeah. She's not so, easily phased, as we saw in right. both of those episodes. But she's not trying to, like, benevolently save the world or anything no. like that. Well, as far as we know, you never know. I guess that's true. I mean, we haven't... We've done a few episodes with Cam, besides the one coming up that she uh, returned again last year. But we... Because, uh, yeah, Carl's dating her. We'd see her occasionally. But we haven't really got into her personal life, so who knows what we may find out in the future. I don't want to rule anything out. Fair enough. <laughs> so that that was the only reoccurring role you've played yet. Ah, uh, right? yes. So far, so you far. Uh, there was a brand new segment that we did in October, which will be quite a while before it hits the podcast feed. Like right now, it's scheduled for August. Um, but it was called Mystery Dream Team, and you played the lead in that. Yes, I believe. Andy Swallows. Yes, the detective. Tell us about the character. Um, so she's she's the ringleader. So the mm-hmm. segment is, you know, Scooby Doo esque. That's fair. Uh, but uh, you know, you have a another segment where you have a female lead, um, and she has her nerdy admirer, mm-hmm. um, played by Nick. Yes. And um, another character who's kind of brave and bold and not really phased by anything. She's skeptical of the whole Mm -hmm. looking for ghosts. She really just kind of thinks she's running a a scam, basically. Yeah. Kind of like she's... uh, Did you ever watch the show Psych? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think about it until right now. Actually, that's a fair... she could be a little bit of a Sean. That is a fair comparison, actually. She's like, we're doing what we do best, tricking stupid people. (laughs) Except... Well, obviously, the first mo- first episode, they come across Frankenstein's monster. So, are they tricking, or is there a real monster? I don't know. You'll have to listen and find out. And again, we've only had one episode with that yeah. segment. So, again, that's another sort of uh, potential that could be tapped into, but that mm-hmm. hasn't certainly hasn't been fully developed by any sure. stretch. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, but we will be doing that one again, for sure. So, those are your two big roles. And then you've played yeah. a variety of small roles for us as well. Yeah, I sort of feel like I'm the... Sort of fill in where you need me, kind of actress. I, th- I think uh, that's how a lot of people start on the show. Yeah, they uh, come in and they do lots of guest roles, but they haven't yet gotten those big roles that keep coming back. So, mm-hmm. of course, those are the roles available to you until you land more of the big ones. Yeah, I kind of enjoy um, the challenge of doing a bunch of different little roles because it's important to me that I make all my roles sound as distinct from each other as possible. Even if I'm just playing variations of a young female, I like to have something in my sound that goes, okay, that's this character. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't sound like, oh, that's just Karen reading another role. Well, you played a little boy in our most recent live show. I did. That was that was a blast. I got <laughs> to use my nerdy Bart Simpson-esque voice. That was fun. That was a very strong episode, I felt. A lot of... Uh, we don't want to spoil anything, but... Definitely a lot of fun voices coming together. Yeah, for um, sure. Oh, yeah. In an interesting way. That was a great episode. So what what are, are, is your favorite or favorite uh, part or parts that you've played so far? Any stand out of all of the little... Well, I think Cam, just because that's the only character that I've really had any span of episodes to develop and sort of uh, sink my teeth into and be like, okay, this character lives here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the only disadvantage to sort of being the fill-in. I do want to have a character that develops across many episodes um, that I feel a personal connection to that's not just kind of a a once and done. Yeah. I understand. Um, you know, but at the same time, like, I don't want to get, like, pigeonholed as one thing either. Mm-hmm. So uh, right now I'm kind of enjoying the versatility, I think. That's one benefit of the type of show we do is there's always more parts yeah. to do. Um, and then you also play another role in the troupe in that you are the official troupe vocal coach. Yeah. Talk about that. So um, outside of the show... I am a speech-language pathologist, and I specialize in voice and voice disorders. So what that means is, uh, well, I'm actually going back to school uh, to OSU. I start in the fall. I'm doing my doctorate in uh, speech and hearing science and a dissertation in voice physiology. But basically, um, I have had jobs where I look at vocal cords, 
and help diagnose pathologies. And then I rehab disordered voices. So disordered speaking voices, people like teachers and stuff like that who use their voice all day long for a living and it doesn't do what they need it to do. I do the same thing with singers. I would um, consider that my specialty. I am a singing voice specialist. So, um, and part of my approach to therapy involves uh, Estel voice training. Mm -hmm. And I have taught some workshops for the group um, on Estel voice training. And basically what that is, it's here's the parts of your throat. Here's how to learn how to control each part individually. Here's how this part of your throat contributes to your sound. But once you master all of these, this control over your voice, that it unlocks new options. So not only does it help like keep your voice healthy and all that kind of stuff, but it also unlocks a lot of new possibilities. Yeah. And I rely on that heavily, especially when you're like doing a different role every month to mm -hmm. try to make it sound different from something else I've already done. Yeah, I mean, a bunch of the troop, not all of them, um, but a bunch of them have gotten to take that workshop. I, I took the workshop. Mm -hmm. And I think that is certainly something that helps with a show like ours with so many different characters and so many different things to do. Um, we had one actor that for a long time had a character that was kind of hurting his voice a little bit if he had to do too many lines that mm -hmm. he worked with. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's one way you help. So I don't know. I kind of think of it as I'm not a sports guy at all, but it's kind of to me thinking of it like, oh, well, there's the on the football team, you have that um, the team doctor or whatever that kind of helps the keep everybody in fighting shape. And I think that's a great point. I think that's exactly like what my role is. And I think in the field and things are, are I think slowly starting to change. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, your, your throat and your vocal cords, they're muscles, just like every other part of your body. And any voice user is a vocal athlete and you need to tr practice, train and be treated as such. Mm -hmm. But I still feel like there, you know, when it comes to vocal injury, unfortunately, there's still a stigma, you know, when uh, Adele has surgery and then she does her second tour and has to cancel the last few performances, you know, she's like plastered all over the internet. Whereas in the sports world, if you get injured during a game, you're sort of looked at more like, oh, you're a badass, you'll be back next season. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but vocal athleticism is the same, uh, if not more kind of tedious and intense in a way. Mm. Yeah. What made you want to bring those skills over to our troop? Uh, well, honestly, had I not had my background in Estelle and doing what I do, I don't think I would have been confident doing something like this, even though I, you know, I do have a background in theater. I have a minor in music and voice performance, and I've done singing and musicals and things like that. But something like this is totally different because, you know, the way you look doesn't matter, the way you dance doesn't matter, and you're really relying solely on your voice to uh, be identified and create a character. And especially when you have to do so many different things, you need to know, okay, how can I change my sound? What can I do for this character to convey X, Y, Z? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, what got you to first audition for us in the first place? Um, I just saw the thing that you post sometimes on that, like, theater and audition group announcements mm -hmm. in Columbus, and I saw that, and, you know, I, I work three jobs, and I auditioning's been a barrier because of rehearsal schedules and mm -hmm. timing and stuff like that, so uh, this is super flexible. And the other thing is I've, you know, I'm – relatively new to the area. I've been here four and a half years now, but I definitely wanted a group of people to just be part of and be involved in. So I'm like, not a heavy rehearsal schedule. And like, it, literally in the audition packet, it's like, we're a, just a fun, chill group of people looking for new members. And I'm like, that sounds perfect. <laughs> and then, you know, I took my uh, Estel background and all of that to be like, well, let me just send in a bunch of different voices and see what happens. Yeah. So. And you got cast. And you uh, got cast a bunch of times. Yeah. Um, until we finally said, hey, be a troop member. Yeah. And that, even that was relatively recently. See, it's what, yeah. March? And I was officially a troop member in, what, December? I think so. That sounds about right. Uh, because I, obviously not only do we cast you a number of ways, in a number of parts, but then you're also contributing in other ways as well. So it made sense to lock you in so that we knew you'd keep coming back. Yay! <laughs> was it intimidating to join a show that was already so far into progress? Kind of. But I, rem I remember my first rehearsal. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what happened? Something about, like, 
Nick started talking to me in some ridiculous voice. And then um, someone made a comment, oh, don't mind uh, him. He's just an asshole or something. And then I, I loved an insult at him. I'm like, oh, so you get typecast then. And like everyone started <laughs> laughing and thought that was funny. And then I was just kind of like, yep, I'm going to fit in. This is going to be just fine. <laughs> these are my, I could tell them right away, these are my kind of people. Excellent. Uh, what um, segment have you not been in that you would like to be in? Have you been in every, you haven't been in everything, have you? I don't know if I've been in Daniel Kravitz. Yeah, that one tends to have a little fewer guest parts, I think. I don't think I've been in Daniel Kravitz. And I just did my first Universe Journey. It was a really small role in mm. January, but I haven't done much in Universe Journey. I've been in Porn Stars quite a few times. I've been in Top Notch as Cam and then as other roles. Yeah. Uh, I think those are the two. I was in Packer and Ratcliffe. Oh, that was a fun that role. One, that was because you and Dan did something really unique. And that hasn't come out yet, but it will be out soon. Uh, uh, and I got to put my kind of voice coach... Uh, background to yeah, I don't want to give too much away, but that was that was a lot of fun and yeah. distortions and doing something super different. That was a that was really fun. Yeah. Well, have you listened to any of these Meet the Casts before? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I try to give actors a chance to pitch me on like if you really want to be in a story or you have an idea for a character, now's a great time to bring up and be like, hey, I should be in this because or this way any ideas or thoughts the only thought and i've, I've actually thought about this mm -hmm. um and i know when i first taught the workshops i was like you guys are gonna like this stuff because i hear all of you guys using these things and doing all these different things with your voice i don't hear it all from the same person mm. but across the cast i hear all of these things but the only like voice quality uh, type of thing that has not been utilized on the show is opera. Mm, that's true. So, uh, and not giving too much away with the recent Top Notch episode. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking if there could be a big bad that somehow featured opera quality. I don't know if you could make it like funny bad on purpose, like Florence Foster Jenkins kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or, like, just, like, loud, shrill, like, kind of caricature and ridiculous. I like it. Something operatic. Yeah, and she could, I don't know, like, send sonic waves and paralyze people <laughs> with her voice. Or, I don't know, whatever, however you I wanted mean, to write any that. Power any power in Top Notch can be ridiculous. It can be it's, ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like you could, um, I guess, something unique to me that I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. I would offer that up. Um, other than that. Um, as far as storyline, mm -hmm. you know, I know you have very much have a, a vision, and I don't know where new characters kind of fit into that. So I have some loose vision. Um, I can say, like, one character that kind of uh, new is a great example in mm -hmm. Universe Journey, where I'd already kind of thought about a character like that, and then Kristen came up with this whole pitch for that type of character. Mm -hmm. And we did open it up to audition for anybody, but yeah. it just showed how much thought she'd put into it and oh, the way yeah. she approached the audition. Absolutely. Um, and so something like that, like you could kind of organically sometimes work things in, or we've had guest parts like uh, Brendan Talty played a character named Josh in a one-off Daniel Kravitz as a guest star, and then I was like, oh, I see possibility with that character, and obviously Josh has been part of the mm -hmm. Daniel Kravitz segment this year, um, for the last year or so. So, you know, there's certainly ways to work other characters in. I mean, Cam became as was entered into as a reoccurring love interest for Carl. Mm -hmm. Not the type of character we'd see every top notch episode, but you know, somebody we, that's part of the fabric, the framework. Sure. Um, so I think there's always room for new characters. So we kind of did this backwards in that I started talking to you about your parts first, whereas in other Meet the Cast, we've gone into background first. So let's get into your background. When did you first uh, perform or find a love of performing? Um. I would say from the time I was four or five, <laughs> uh, my twin cousins would come visit. So I, I have two sisters, and my twin cousins would come visit and stay with us every summer, and I was friends with all kinds of kids in the neighborhood. And we would sing and choreograph uh, a bunch of numbers in the backyard, and my mom would uh, record them with the old cameras that recorded to VHS. I mean, this was in, like you know, the early 90s. Um, and we did a lot of uh, musical theater type of numbers and a lot of oldies and stuff like that. So I'd say that's when I 
first had a love of performing, and I definitely grew up listening to a lot of musical theater. Um, and, you know, and I was in church choir growing up, and I was in choir all through high school and college. I did theater and music and show choir and all that stuff through high school. I did um, voice lessons and choir all through college, and in college um, is when I did my main musical theater roles in a community theater capacity. Wow. Any favorite roles? Um, I was Lily in Carnival, which is an old uh, 1962 musical yeah. Carnival. Yeah. Really? It, wait, maybe. So people is confuse it? it with Carousel. That's it. Never yeah. mind. I haven't seen Carnival. Yeah. I was um, thinking Rodgers and Hammerstein. This isn't Rodgers it's and not, Hammerstein. Okay. No, it's Bob Merrill, the same guy who wrote Funny Girl. Okay, I've seen Funny Girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an older, more obscure musical for sure. Um, but I was the main character in that. And then I was also Hope Harcourt, which is like a supporting role in Anything Goes, okay. the Cole Porter show. Cool. Those are probably my biggest musical theater roles. And then, you know, I went to grad school and then became an adult and got a job and, like, life happened. <laughs> so there was a really long theater hiatus there sure. for a while. Absolutely. Uh, do you do any other performing now besides our show involved in anything? Uh, well, Mad Lab stuff. And I am looking to eventually be on Ensemble, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and... In January, we did the uh, Broadway cabaret show. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine was visiting from Argentina, and he and I co-directed a uh, basically just Broadway cabaret review at Mad Lab, and I think everybody had a lot of fun doing it. A lot of the IABD people were in that, and I mm -hmm. think there's a lot of enthusiasm and interest for doing that on a semi-regular basis. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it's terrible, cool. but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, you had talked about wanting to do that again. Um, and then, yeah, you've done some, have you done any OGP things yet? Um, I was in the witch dance in the Halloween oh, show. You were. I was roped into doing that. I'm like, Marianne, you understand I don't dance, right? <laughs> um, but that was fun. And again, it's just been a more logistic thing because I've been sure. out of town and traveling for Estel and stuff like that. But um, I think once I start school in the fall, I'll have time and I'll be a little bit more settled. So I'll be able to devote to auditions and a more routine um, audition schedule and things like that. But this is awesome because, you know, we have our one rehearsal before mm -hmm. the show and you can literally phone that one in pretty much. And then uh, you have the... No, <laughs> no, 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 no. You know what I mean? You, you mean can sense. literally video you chat can. it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it does it. So, you know, distance isn't a factor. Right. Where did you go to college? Where did I go to college? So um, I actually transferred a couple of times, but I graduated from Westchester University outside of Philadelphia. Okay. And then I did my master's at James Madison University in Northern Virginia. Um, and I'll be going to OSU in the, the fall. The Ohio State the University. The Ohio State University. Here in Columbus, Ohio. Correct. So you've moved around a little bit of, in a certain part of the country, mm -hmm. but moved around. Moved around quite a bit. Um, I was born in Northern Virginia, and but I don't remember that because uh, we moved to upstate New York where my dad's from when I was one. I would say that I grew up in upstate New York, uh, but we left there when I was going into high school, and I spent the first two years of high school back in Virginia, uh, did the last two years of high school, and that's kind of where I feel like I found myself, so to speak, and, you know, became a, a theater nerd slash glee kid. <laughs> uh, that's definitely who I was the last two years of high school, um, but I graduated high school in central Pennsylvania. Um, and then I, you know, I went to undergrad in Pennsylvania just a couple hours away, went back to Virginia for my master's. Then I moved to Florida for two and a half years for mm -hmm. my first job at a school. And I had a two year contract down there. So at the end of that, I, um, kind of threw darts at the map and applied for jobs and ended up here in Columbus. So do you like moving around a lot? Do you plan to keep doing it? <sighs> I, I like traveling and I like excitement. Mm -hmm. And like right now I'm literally a couch surfing gypsy and all my stuff is in a friend's basement. I was just in Florida and California for three weeks. I'm going to Argentina for a month. I'm going on a giant road trip around the country. And like, I like to travel, but I would really like to stop moving <laughs> and just eventually put roots down the, somewhere and then just 
take lots of trips every year. I get that. Somewhere with some stability. Exactly. And exactly. Columbus is a great city to do that, I'm just saying. It is, it is. <laughs> I, you know, I, I kind of struggled when I first moved here. I'm not going to lie. You know, I loved Florida. I loved that it was sunny and hot all the time. I made friends right away. But when I moved here, you know, I was working a lot, and there weren't really many people my age sort of where in the same walk of life, so to speak, as mm-hmm. um, where I was working. So um, it was it was hard. It was hard to meet people. You know, it is it does snow here, which I'm not a fan of. <laughs> it is gray and rainy here often, you know. <laughs> but now, I don't know, finally being a part of something again is a big deal. Well, and Columbus has a great theater community. They do. I mean, they really do. If, you're just doing IBD and Mad Lab, which is just the tip of it. There are exactly. a couple of dozen other theater troops, more than that, uh, yeah. as well as dozens of improv troops and lots of theaters and all kinds of stuff always going on here. So Yeah, but with my job, it got really hard because mm-hmm. I was salaried, and yeah. yeah, my schedule might end at 4.30, but sometimes I don't get out till 5, 5.30, yep. you know, so with the occasional emergency keeping me there till 6, and I can't get across town and do a 6 to 10 rehearsal every night, sure. you know? So, I mean, it was, it was kind of limiting there for a while but um now as a student i don't think i'll have that that problem besides travel what else do you like to do in your free time sing um pretty much vocal cords and travel is my life (laughs) if i'm being honest well it's nice if your work is something you're passionate about and want to spend your time doing exactly exactly and then i'd say that's very much the case with me um so i you know i'm a medical speech pathologist i help out at uh, Riverside, working in the neuro unit on the weekends. And that doesn't have anything to do with vocal cords, really. That's just general medical speech pathology. But then I do um, have a small following of private voice students. And especially lately, I've been going around and um, teaching workshops. I was just teaching some of the Estel workshops down in Florida. Mm-hmm. I've been to Japan helping on courses, and I'm getting ready to go to Argentina to teach there. So I'm, I'm very into that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that definitely occupies a large portion of my time. I steamrolled right through school, you know, and I've always been very like, I guess I'm, if I'm being honest, I'm a workaholic. And, uh, but I never really took time for me. I never studied abroad and there's lots of things that I wish that I had done. So I'm very much taking this time to go do those things. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I was just in California and Florida. I'm going to uh, Argentina. I'm taking a giant road trip, so I'm going from uh, Chicago, starting in Chicago to South Dakota, and then through the yellow, through the uh, national parks, Yellowstone Glacier, uh, Grand Teton, all the way to Seattle, up to Vancouver, down the Pacific Coast to San Francisco, then out to Vegas through the national parks in Utah. And then uh, back to Columbus from there. That's going to take about a month. Oh, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a long trip. Yeah. That's not even spending all that much time in some of those places. Uh, yeah. No. I mean, most places just kind of two, three days at the most. Yeah. Wow. And you got your passport all ready to go. Obviously. Oh, I've had, I've had my passport. Yeah. I was just in Japan in uh, November. Mm-hmm. I got invited to do that last minute. Um, but that, that worked out. I was there for about eight days, helped teach an Estel course, and then just saw a bunch of um, temples and went to the Pokemon store and <laughs> ate a bunch of um, weird th- weird but delicious things. <laughs> Are I, you an adventurous eater? Um, I would say for the most part I don't like pork, and I won't eat anything with any pork in it, but other than pretty much anything else is fair game. I'm supposedly have a mild milk allergy but i cheat with that all the time <laughs> uh, but yeah at all? some yeah the my relationship with cooking is if when i've worked all day i do not want to stand in the kitchen and cook and then clean up dishes mm. but if i have a day off and i'm just kind of around the house you know watching tv or um work you know singing playing music or whatever um i like to put something on the stove it might take a couple of hours i like to cook Kind of as an afternoon project, mm. I find that enjoyable, but not as like a day to day thing. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I guess, yeah, I guess other hobbies like I'm a musician, sort of not a very good one, but that's definitely on the list. And my time off is practicing my instruments, and I'm just super rusty at piano and stuff like that. But what other instruments do you play? Uh, guitar a little bit, ukulele. 
Um, but again, not very, just very basic, <laughs> not very well. Um, so. I do have a super, I, I like anime. Mm. Um, I have a past as a gamer. I had a World of Warcraft addiction there for several years. <laughs> but I've been sober now for close to seven years. <laughs> and I have to be careful with video games because if I get into it, then that might be all I do. And then I would be doing nothing else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if you've listened to these, you know you have to a- answer a random question from another cast member. Mm-hmm. Have you listened yes. to Kristen's? No, because you told me not to, because cool. I know the question is supposed to be a surprise. It is supposed to be a surprise, so I'm glad you didn't listen. Who is the most formative Disney character in her life, like from her childhood growing up? I got a great answer. Good. <laughs> okay, so um, who is the most formative uh, Disney character from my life? That's a... F- Fantastic question. Okay, (laughs) so growing up, I never gave a shit about the princesses. Okay. Couldn't care less. But I was, I I guess that's something I would be remiss if I didn't mention. I am a pretty avid animal lover of all kinds. Um, I used to have pet ducks. I think those were my favorite pets ever. Um, And, you know, now I'm part, I love dogs, I love everything, but I'm definitely partial to cats. Mm. But I love elephants and giraffes. I mean, I love everything. But And if I could have a baby elephant, I totally would. <laughs> but anyway... Although it wouldn't quite gel with travel so much. Probably not. That's it's the really only... It's good you don't have a pet right now. Yeah, it is good that I don't have a pet right now. But I wonder, when I once I get settled, I don't think that's going to last very long. Well, cats are easy. You can leave them for a week and just put out extra food and litter and they're good. Exactly. So. But anyway, so um, I love critters. So my fascination with Disney creatures was always like the little cute sidekick. Mm-hmm. So I didn't like Ariel. I liked Flounder. Sure. I didn't. Oh, well, I, of all the princesses, I think Belle's my favorite because she reads. But I didn't really care about Belle. I liked Chip the Cup. Mm. Um, but I think of all of them, the most, and my mom would definitely say the most influential was Jack the Mouse, the red cap, skinny yeah. mouse. Yeah, from Cinderella. So. I went through this phase when I was like three, where when I was really into a character, like I was the character and you weren't allowed to call me anything else. (laughs) So literally for, my mom says for a year solid, she could not call me Karen because I insisted on people calling me Jack. (laughs) And she even tells this one story, like we were at the pediatrician's office and they called my name, Karen, out of the waiting room and I was mad. And you know, my mom proceeded to tell the doctor you know she just she won't let me call her karen she insists that you call her jack and the doctor just thought that was the most ridiculous thing she had ever heard so she had my mom step out of the room and my mom was just kind of like all right go for it and um a few minutes later my mom hears this blood curdling scream coming out of the exam room no i'm jack (laughs) <laughs> and I know I was a really, really weird kid, but um, eventually my mom got me through that phase. She talked me into, instead of insisting that I was Jack the Mouse, then the characters could live with us. Mm. So eventually, like, Ninja Turtles live with us. Um, Spike the Pink Dragon from My Little Pony lived with us. Casper the Ghost lived with us. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so the short answer to that question is um, Jack the Mouse. Why was he so formative? What, what about him? I don't know. I just, he was the cute sidekick thing, and I liked him okay. a lot. Okay. Well, while we don't have any other cast members, you get to go ahead and ask a random question of some future person, because eventually we'll have somebody else in the troop. I can't just ask you? Uh, I mean, I guess if you want to ask me a question, you can ask me a question. Along the lines of travel and stuff, I want to know about people's bucket list. Mm. I want to know. I want to know someone's number one bucket list item. You know, I don't. I don't know that I have a bucket list. I mean, no? if there's something I really want to do, then I yeah. find a way to make it happen. I mean, yeah, there's places I'd like to visit that I haven't been, but like where? Most of the world. <laughs> I haven't been that many places. I, over, I mean, out of the country, I've been to Canada a few times, like Toronto a couple of times. I've been to um, England and Wales in college on a band tour. Uh, but that's it. So, you know, there's lots of other... I like historical things, so I would like seeing the historical sites in Europe, or I'd love to go visit Australia, mainly places where they speak English, because I'd get very weird and uncomfortable if I can't understand people. Yeah, it makes it an interesting experience, for sure. So, um, I don't know. But, like, 
if there's something I really like when I was a teenager, I decided I really should skydive. So you did. So I was gonna say. Any, so did you went? Yeah, I did. I was. I finally like. I was turning thirty, and I'm like, I gotta do it now, or I'll never get to do it. Tell so. me. So that's kind of one thing that's on my bucket list that I'm like scared to do because I don't know. I would do it, but I don't know how I would like it. How was it? So, uh, well, my, I went with my brothers, who are military guys. The, one was in the Army, one was in the Air Force. Actually, the Air Force guy's still in the Air Force as a pilot trainer to teach people how to fly planes. And they insisted, we are not doing tandem. If we're going skydiving, we are going to do the eight-hour class and solo jump without somebody strapped to your back. Oh, God. Um, and for them, that, of course, made sense, because they done things that were dangerous and risky and they'd always been those kind of people i'm the oldest they're the younger brothers you know i've got several i've got a bunch of siblings and i uh said well i'm not sitting there for eight hours and watching you take a class and just waiting around so if you're gonna do it i'll do it too um so we did the eight hour class and then uh yeah this was that's four it? years ago I can't believe they let, they let you jump out of a plane by yourself after just eight so, hours the uh, instructor jumps next to you and they hold on to a, a handle on your suit until your chute opens, then they let you go. Okay. Which was good. Actually, two instructors jumped next to you, like backup, just to really make sure. Um, which was good, because I never did find the cord to pull, so they pulled <gasps> the cord for me. Oh my gosh. There's a YouTube video. I paid for the cameraman, because I was like, nobody's going to believe I did it, because I'm not the type of person people would imagine I know. jumped out of a plane. I'm not going to lie. Stand-up. I'm really... See, I'm I glad know. I asked this question, I'm glad I asked you this so, question. I never thought you would have been was, skydiving. It was an exhilarating experience. I've never been that afraid of heights, but after that, I'm really not afraid of heights. Mm-hmm. Um... I, w- I hated the free fall, which is why most people skydive. Right. We did like a full minute of free fall because we jumped from like 15,000 feet. Uh, and that part I hated. Uh, the wind was just blew the goggles against your face. You couldn't really see. You couldn't really do anything. I, I just did not like it at all. So you didn't feel like you were flying? No. You but didn't... once the chute opened, I loved it. So I would go again if I could pull the cord as soon as I jump. Because I really enjoyed... I mean, I... The parachute, it's so easy to control. Like, they give you a spot to land, and I found the spot and came in exactly where. I came in so soft, they said I should have just landed on my feet, but they taught me that I was supposed to roll. And so I rolled, because I'm I'm an instruction follower. Gotcha. So I practiced rolling. I rolled when I hit the ground. They're like, you were coming in so soft, why don't you just stay on your feet? And I was like, because you told me to roll. I, what did I take an eight-hour class for? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you pulled my cord for me. I was going to at least follow that direction. I mean, it was great. It was real easy to, to guide it. But, you know, of course, every time you jump, there's a chance something could go wrong. And that scares the crap out of me, too. So, I know. I mean, because the eight-hour course is mostly, here's all the things that could go wrong and what you should do if those things go wrong. Because can't you pull the chute too early? You can, but that's not a huge concern. And the where we went, all the, our backpacks had backup chutes that right. the little meter on it. If you hit a thousand feet and your chute wasn't open, the backup would automatically go. So like they made it as safe as you can make it. But I um, I guess it would technically be my step grandfather mm-hmm. was a paratrooper in World War Two. And he was the type of person, like, his brother, his father all died at, like, 55. So once he hit 55, he was like, hey, I'm living on borrowed time. And he, after World War II, was an avid, avid, avid skydiver. And he was working on his base number, which is a bridge, no, a building, an aerial span. I forget what S is. And then an Earth, E is an Earth formation. Mm. And he couldn't find a building that would allow him to jump off of it, but he had the ASE part done. Oh, okay. But anyway, he did, he did pass in a skydiving accident, but they think he actually had a heart attack in the air because he never, he, he never even tried to open his chute. Oh, that's... Yeah. Uh, it's sad, but he always said that that's exactly how he wanted to go, so... Well, there you go. Ugh. Yeah, so I think that, but that I think that experience has me a little bit like ah, I want to do it, but yeah, I mean, it, it's risky behavior. There's always going to be a risk to it. You're never yeah, going to be exactly. certain. If I was going to do it, it would absolutely be a tandem. That's the the safer way to do it yeah. for sure. But and much easier. It's like thirty minutes instead of eight hours. Exactly, and cheaper too. Mm. So. Okay, uh, I do. So we will have another meet the cast though at some point. So, do you have a question for whoever the next person is? What do you consider a turning point in your life? And if you had to do it over again, would you make a different a <sighs> different decision? Uh, we could do a whole series of podcasts about that in of itself. Just mm. 
Anyway, so thank you for joining me and for joining IABD. Thank you for having me, and yeah. thank you for having me join IABD. Absolutely. It's Abed and Radio Hour number 118. Meet the cast number 20, Karen Perta. Starred Karen Perta as Karen Perta, hosted by Jerome Wetzel. Follow us on social media at IABD Presents, and check out our website at salvinandradiohour.com. Did we just say I? I think we all just both just said IADB. IABD. I A B D. I think we did we. Uh, yeah, we did. Okay, I think. Well, I-A-B-D. it won't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been done. It's all been done.